Um, so a little bit about me. My name is Janet Miller, and I'm a leader in the Charlottesville, Virginia area. I know we have some people who were signing on today from outside of Virginia Skyline Council, which is really exciting. Welcome to you all. We're glad to have you. Um, and my background is that uh, not only am I a Girl Scout leader for a senior and ambassador troop, but I also do a lot of work in programming and coding, um, given the type of job I do. I'm, I'm actually a marketer, but I do a lot of programming co and coding as part of my job. And so um, I thought this would be a great badge for us to work on together, this badge series. And two weeks ago, we did the Coding Basics badge, and now we're going to work today on the next badge in that series, which is the Senior Digital Game Designer badge. Um, and uh, again, as I mentioned, there are, uh, before we get started with that too, let me just also mention that uh, I appreciate all of you all muting while we're talking, unless you have something you want to say, because it does help with the background noise. Um, and I just say, I applaud you all because I know many of you probably never had to use video chat before all this started happening. And I'm, I am constantly impressed with the sort of etiquette you all have already learned and adapted to in a short period of time of using video conferencing. So uh, I appreciate that. It makes it very uh, easy to do these types of badges when you when everyone is helpful and trying to uh, to help so that we can hear. The other thing that you can do, uh, if you have a question throughout and if you don't unmute or you're having any difficulty, there is a chat area. You see the, uh, I've got the blue arrow pointing to it in this GoToMeeting um, tool. You can also just chat with me and you can send a private message to me if you need to, uh, if you have a question or a problem and you don't wanna say it out loud. So you can do that with the chat box. As I mentioned, this is now the second, so it's that middle badge uh, in the series for Coding for Good Journey. And um, we have uh, already done uh, the Coding Basics badge, which we did two weeks ago. And two weeks from today, we will do at the same time, 4 to 6 p.m., two weeks from today, we will also do the app developer badge, which is the final one in the Coding for Good Journey. Uh, well, I'm not actually sure it's a journey. I called it a journey. I don't think it really actually is a journey, but it's a, it's a set of badges. So um, so today we're going to talk about and focus on, on game design, which is really interesting. And one of the things I wanted to talk about first was it's interesting that the Girl Scouts decided to put this game design badge as part of a larger um, effort and a larger badge project called Coding for Good. And um, I was real interested in that because we can do coding for a lot of things. We can program things for a lot of different reasons. And so as you think about games, I thought to myself, well, yeah, I guess you really can use games for good endeavors, not just for entertainment, but actually helping make change for people and helping teach them things as an example. And we're going to go through a couple of examples here of how you can use gaming and, mo and mobile game design or game design for good things. And um, because all of you are seniors, I'd really like you to keep this in mind as you think about your gold award project, because you could potentially you make a game as part of your gold award project to help educate people or change people's behavior, all sorts of really great things. So here are some examples I wanted to share with you of how games are used, digital games in particular, are used for good and, and what are they used for not just for entertainment but other good types of good this is one example of a website that my younger daughter used early on called abc mouse and this has really been very popular especially as of late with a lot of kids at home and parents are saying how do i help keep my younger kids engaged and learning things and they are a website that has lots of games that help teach younger kids Things like the ABCs and shapes and colors and things like that and and basic math or basic spelling. And um, and so this is just one example of how you could use programming and, and design for good is helping kids learn things. Um, another example that some of you may be familiar with, reflex math. And my, both of my kids use reflex math in elementary school. Uh, my oldest daughter, who's on the call today, is in high school. She's a senior. Uh, Senior Girl Scout, she's a, uh, a rising sophomore in high school now. Um, but in her younger days when she was in elementary school, reflex math was very popular. And as you can see here, reflex math does much the same thing as ABC Mouse. 
in order for the kids to compete and move along this path in this game, they have to solve basic math questions. And so um, that's just another way to kind of reinforce our skills. Another thing that uh, came up about maybe like 10, 12 years ago was using games for getting kids to be active, adults too, frankly. And uh, we have a Wii game system. And we had this is actually a game we have. It's called uh, Nickelodeon Dance. And my youngest pulled it out the other day to play again because she was like, what is this all about? She'd forgotten about it. And it has all these Nickelodeon characters like Dora in it. And it gets kids up and moving. It's a game that gives you points for actually moving around and moving your body. And so another great way you could have a game that encourages really good things for kids. And finally, I also wanted to share this one. This is one that's probably more for your age and for older kids or for adults. This is a site called Fiki. And the purpose of this site is to help people understand and learn uh, which uh, how to dis dis decipher, I want to decipher or look at different news stories and determine which ones are uh, fake news and to help educate you about how to spot the signs of what could be fake news and what is not. So you can even have games for adults that help them educate themselves about different things. Now, um, when we start with a game, every game really starts with a story. And um, if you think about the games that you play, all of the video games and so forth that you play, they have a point, they have a purpose. Early every game has a, a purpose to it, a story. And generally, there are some things you want to think about in your story. Where does the game take place? Who are the characters? Is the main character even human? Like maybe you have a dragon as your main character. Um, what are the main events that happen to that character? And then what challenges they face along the way? Because that's part of the fun of the game is having a challenge and overcoming it. Um, so I want to share with you why thinking through the game and its story is so important. And it's something we want to usually do think about early on in the game process as we think about what kind of game we want to have. And this one I want to share with you is from my childhood. Uh, there was a game called E.T. You guys probably have heard of the movie E.T., the extraterrestrial that was popular in the 80s. And when it came out, Atari, which was the main game console at the time, it was one of the most popular ones, they rushed really quickly to put out a game to have it ready for Christmas and the holiday season. They developed this game in six weeks and had it to market which is crazy fast. And so they didn't really think through how they their storyline for this game. If you've watched the movie E.T., you know E.T. wants to get home. He's, he's ended up on the planet Earth, and his goal is to get home. And so that was the goal of the game. It was kind of like a journey game. You're going to follow steps throughout a journey. And uh, you guys can feel free to laugh out loud when I show you just how bad the graphics were back in the 80s. But here's what the E.T. game looked like. <laughs> and, um, and that was the main screen. And then, and this is now almost 40 years ago. So, it's, I mean, the graphics were not very good back then. But also, what was difficult about this particular game is they made it so that on your journey, if you did not get all of the steps correct on your journey, like you didn't collect this item or that item at the right time, you had to walk back, retrace your steps and go find all these things again. So like you think you're at the end and guess what? You can't phone home and you can't get saved because guess what? Uh, you forgot to get this one part or you overlooked this. And you got to spend all your time going back through the game with these terrible graphics and, and finding where this part is. There's ET and there's, I don't know, some infector or something. And there he again, he's at the government buildings and stuff. It was just, like I said, terrible, terrible graphics. Um, I had this game and I played this game and it was very, very frustrating as a user because, you know, the storyline was really frustrating. I would go through and I've, there was no way for me to remedy a mistake. I just would have to go back through and I'll practically play the whole game from the start to get if I didn't do every step right along the way. And so it was really not well thought about. And a lot of folks were very frustrated. 
And it is credited, E.T., this game is credited with the downfall of the entire Atari system. Uh, they were the king of gaming systems at that time. And they were credited, basically, this was such a flop. It was, it's a colossal video game flop that um, the, the people just wouldn't buy it. Um, that Apparently, they said probably 600,000 copies of this game were buried in a landfill in Arizona. And this was urban legend for many years until about six years ago when they uncovered the landfill. I don't know if y'all can see the ET game in the landfill of stuff, but there's many of them there. And they found like over 600,000 copies of the game in this landfill because Atari could not sell them. So I tell you that story because as you think about making your own games, I want you to really focus on the story and the purpose of the game because if you don't have a good concept and you don't think this through before you start the programming process, you could have a real disaster on your hands like Atari and you don't want to do that. You don't want to spend all your time and effort just to have something fail. So um, do you all have any examples of maybe games that you feel like were not really well designed? You can certainly unmute and share. Uh, maybe there's a game that you've played that you think was really horrible or really great. Do you have one you want to share? Uh, all of the Wii controls for the Wii system, the Wii controls are really bad. Some of the games are good, but the controls are horrible. Yeah. It's just not fun to use. Yeah. Like, uh, Skyward Sword is an amazing game, but it, it, I hate the controls, so I'm not going to play it. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is very frustrating, isn't it? Anybody else have anything they want to share? Maybe they played a different game system. Some DS games were not that good. Which one? DS games? really hard to reach the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Like Nintendo? They had yeah. hard like to reach a goal. It was hard. Is there one in particular that you didn't like? Um, oh, I never got to reach the goal. Um, yeah, and see, it's that's really frustrating. frustrating. Yeah, it's very frustrating as a user. Um, I was just doing the badge, uh, the journey, actually, last week with my younger cadets uh, for Think Like a Programmer. And one of the things we talk about in that journey, if you've ever done it, is user-centered design, like thinking about what the user wants and making it fun for them. And it's really frustrating when you can't reach your goal, you know, and it makes it less fun to play the game and then you just stop playing it. So that's unfortunate. Anybody else have one they want to share? Okay. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the next piece of our um, talk today. And that is, this is part of the badge requirement, is thinking about what will your characters look like. So as we think through, I want you, you can use your piece of paper and, and your writing instrument, or you can use the computer on your own and type things in in a word processing program, whatever is easiest for you. We want to think about the story and what our characters will look like. And part of this badge talks about avatars. Does anybody know what I mean when I say an avatar? It's like what you play as. <laughs> That's right, yeah, like, like your character, right? And so um, these days there's many, many tools that help us design avatars and you can use them for multiple purposes. You can use them on your Facebook account or your YouTube account or any, any number of different things. And so uh, this is an example of one tool I use. This is called Bitmoji. This is actually pretty popular with uh, the mom set, the, the people who are my friends and are my age. Uh, a lot of people use this. It's, on, it's a mobile, uh, mobile phone app. And you can start, you see on the left, I could start, I could say either I'm male or female, and then I could pick like my skin tone and all the different things about me. And I could make my avatar. I could make one that looks like me if I wanted to, or I could make someone who doesn't look like me at all if I wanted to. You know, I could have something just completely different. And so um, in the end, this is what mine looks like. There's Miss Janet out on a hike. Uh, I don't have good hiking shoes on. Um, and uh, the Girl Scouts are probably not going to like that I don't have good hiking shoes on. But there I am because I like to be in the woods. I like to be outside. And um, so that's 
basically what I look like. Not entirely, but basically. Um, but there are many different apps out there. You can create your own avatar, and that's what we're going to spend a few minutes doing right now. So I want to share with you a couple of places that you can make an avatar. Um, for those of you who are on the computer only and don't have a mobile phone, because maybe some of you don't have a mobile phone, you can go to avatarmaker.com, and it's free. There's no sign-up required, and you can just make an avatar. You can design your character. Um, I think it's all human characters, so if you had an idea to make a character that was not human, like an animal or, um, or a fantasy character, it might be more difficult to do that there. Um, this website here, and I'll copy these and put them in the chat and in, with everybody, and that way it will hopefully be easier for y'all to copy these if you want to use them. Um, the second one is um, a list of places where you can create avatars for websites. And that one's kind of cool because I found, uh, for instance, I'm going to show you the, the next bullet point. I'm going to show you I created an avatar on Marvel on Marvel HQ, on Marvel's website, you have a, they have a create your own superhero um, place. And I created a different version of Spider-Man. I made it Spider-Girl or whatever. And I, and I did that. And um, that's also free and doesn't require sign up, but you can go to this Google site that someone has put up and you could find sites that let you make avatars that are dragons or animals or superheroes or sports figures. So that's a really good one. And it's on your, uh, that is also on your computer. So you don't have to use it just on your phone. Um, again, I mentioned the next bullet, the third bullet down is the Marvel HQ one where you can create your own superhero. And again, I'll put these, these uh, links in there. You don't have to type them in. I'll put them in the chat in a minute. And uh, you can then create your own superhero. Again, no sign-up required. You can save it. It's pretty cool. And then finally, the one I use, I mentioned Bitmoji. That is only a mobile app, and it is an app for Google and uh, Apple, and it does require a sign-up. So if you don't feel comfortable doing that, you're not allowed to do that because your parents would like you to tell them what apps you're downloading, then um, you can save that one for later. Um, or maybe you don't have a phone, and that's fine. So you can go ahead and, and paste these into the um, chat box, and you guys can go there and click on them and um, go to the one you like. So this is the first one that is Avatar Maker. That's just people only on that one. And then the second one is the list, like a menu, a big menu of different Avatar sites that you can go to. And find, and that's where I found the Marvel one, was on that second one that I just put up there right now. And now I'm going to go ahead and copy the Marvel one. And you can, so whichever one you want to do, go ahead and play around with it. I'm sure you all have done something like this before. I know, like, when we've had um, badges uh, or patches that we get for, like, Nut and candy season, fall product sale. They have sometimes a design your own patch and it'll be, it's like a bitmoji. It's like you and you design your face and all that stuff. I'm sure y'all have done things like this before in other applications, but go ahead and just take a few minutes. We'll take about five minutes. Y'all can play with that. And in the meantime, if anybody has any questions, you can feel free to ask. Uh, just, just unmute yourself and ask. But, you know, play around with those for a few minutes. And some of them, again, will allow you to save your avatar uh, to your computer or to your phone. And that's nice to have for later if you'd like to do that as well. So we'll take like, eh, like five minutes here and we'll come back at 430. And so if you finish early, you know, if you need a bathroom break, need to get a drink of water, feel free. And we'll start back at 430. Y'all go ahead and try this out and see what you think. Oh, and I was going to show you. Avatar. This is my avatar I made on the on the Marvel one. You can change colors. It's pretty cool.
Okay, it's 4.30, so um, is anyone want to show us the avatar that they made? I can sh have you share your screen and you can show us. Anyone want to share? Okay, well, we'll go ahead and move on to the next part of our presentation uh, for the badge. And the next part we're going to talk about is our characters in this game are going to need to make decisions, right? So whatever, whatever scenarios we put them in, whatever kind of storyline we put them in, they're going to need to be able to make decisions. And we call those decision-making um, planning, the planning we do around it, decision trees. And again, characters have to make choices and the choices have outcomes and consequences, right? So like I was telling you with the ET game, if I was walking through this journey, get to the final part and I did not make all of the right decisions in the game, when I got to the end, I couldn't win. And I'm gonna show you an example in a minute. I designed another game uh, myself that was exactly the same kind of situation as ET and um, it involves decision trees. And one of the reasons that we're going to plan this out and plot it out before we begin any kind of programming of our game is that programming takes a lot of time and effort. And you want to think through all the different scenarios and decisions that your character is going to possibly need to make before you start trying to program it. And so as an example of a decision you might have to make, your character may have to make, is if you walk straight, you might fall off a cliff. But if you walk right or left, you wouldn't fall off the cliff. So there are lots of decisions throughout the game that the character is going to need to make, and they will have outcomes to them. And you're going to want to think through all of that before you actually start programming your game. And one way we can do that is with a flowchart. Um, have you all ever used a flowchart before? Basically, all a flowchart is is just a set of directions. And uh, when I was working in the Think Like a Programmer journey with the cadets, we talked about flowcharts there too. Um, trying to give the computer instructions about what we want to do. And so a flowchart is just one way you could think about these decision trees, like all the options your character has and which direction they should go in. Like if they do, do X, then this is going to happen. If they do Y, this other thing is going to happen. If they do Z, something else is going to happen. And so you can plan all of that out. You can also do storyboards. A lot of video game designers do storyboards um, and put their decision trees in a storyboard format. Um, here is an example of a game that I created called Janet's Jack and Jill Game, and I made a flowchart for it. And so I'm going to walk you through where my decision trees are. So in my game, I decided to make it kind of like a journey game. You all know the story of Jack and Jill. They went up the to fetch a pail of water, Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. So we start off with the game begins. Jack and Jill are at home. They leave home to fetch the water. But as they prepare for their journey, they must choose four objects. Maybe there's a ton of objects in their shed, and they have to decide what are the best objects to carry with us on this journey. Now, similar to the ET game, I made this. You make all your choices in the beginning correctly, or else you fail the game which is the best game. So I probably want to go back in there and change it over time and figure out other decision trees that could happen along the way. So pick four objects. I mean, any of the four objects in the shed, and they set out on their journey. Now, the first decision tree is that diamond you see there. Some people call it a decision diamond in a flow chart. And the question is, did they choose to bring a map as one of their items? And if they did not, then they immediately get lost and eaten by bears. Game over. Done. Jack and Jill are eaten by bears. Um, but if they did bring a, a map, awesome. Using the map, they can walk along the trail. But then, oh no, Jack and Jill encounter a dragon on the way. Did they choose to bring dragon repellent as one of the items? If they did not, Jack and Jill get eaten by the dragon and game is over. Uh, if they did bring dragon repellent, however, they can continue in the game. And Jack and Jill use the dragon repellent and escape. Uh, Jack and Jill begin climbing the hill. Oh no, Jack begins to lose his grip. Did they choose to 
bring climbing gear as one of their items. If they do that, well, we know the story. Jack falls down, breaks his crown, and Joe comes tumbling after. Game over. Uh, but if they did bring climbing gear, Jack and Joe make it to the top of the hill. And then that last question here, did they choose to bring a pail as one of their items so they could get their water? And if they did not, Jack and Jill have failed in their mission and die of thirst at the top of the mountain, or a game over, or they fill the pail with water and safely head home. So this is just a way we can think out all of the steps of this journey in our game. And so I want you to think, spend a few minutes right now thinking about your journey you want to do today, because the next step we're going to take after this is we're going to learn how to use an actual gaming console to make a game. So I want you to take just maybe five minutes and start thinking through what kind of game you would like to create and what are some of the decisions that they have to make along the way. And you can write that down on a piece of paper. Again, you can type it on the computer, whatever's easiest for you. And then we'll come back at 440 or 441. And if you want to share, you can. You don't have to. And then we'll go to actually making the game.
Okay, everybody, it's 441 now. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the next step. We all have had a few minutes to work on this. I know it's probably not enough time, and you have to finish all this today. You can work on some of it later. I want to make sure I save enough time and our time together today to get to the really meaty, fun stuff. I know this, this seems like a lot of planning and so forth. It may not seem like the fun part. So I want to move as quickly as I can through this so I can get you to some things that I think are even more fun and exciting. So the next part, after we were, after we planned this out, we put our whole game together. And if you got the email from me, the prep email, um, you received also in that prep email a link to sign up for this website that I'm going to share with you now. Um, and if you haven't, you can just sign up for it right now. Um, it does require you to be 16 years or older or have parent permission. So I would just ask that you um, just you know, run and let your mom and dad or whoever is your parent at home right now to let you know, let you know if you can have permission for this site. The site is called Construct. It's Construct 3 is the name of the program. And the reason I chose this one, this is the URL, and I'll copy it and put it in the um, chat so you all can just click on it. The reason I chose this particular um, uh, game uh, tool was because um, it works on laptops. It works on any kind of uh, uh, tool you have, any, any kind of laptop you might have. I know some people don't have phones. Some of that, some people don't have uh, Mac, Macs or PCs. They have Chromebooks. So there's the link to everybody in the chat, and you can click on that. And I'm going to go there now. I'm going to share. I'm going to change my screen over to my um, Construct Three, and you'll be able to see that in just a second. Let me move that over here. Whoa, there we go. And so when you get there, you'll see a screen that looks like this. And um, so one of the things that's really helpful, you know, I mentioned the coding basics badge. And I was saying how you really don't want to have to code all this stuff um, and uh, make a mistake so or, or miss out on something. Oops, I'm sorry. I accidentally uh, put that on the wrong thing. Um, and so what you want to make sure you're doing is planning everything out in, in advance as best you can. You're probably going to run into some challenges along the way and have to fix things. And that just happens. And I think when our guest speaker comes on at 530, I think that's a really good question to ask him is like, what do you do when you run into these types of, of challenges and problems? And so um, you can sign up again for this free, free trial. You go up here to register or do try it now. You do not have to pay. You do not have to put in a credit card. You can just do 14 days for free. If you like this type of thing, you could pay for it later. It is a paid tool, or you could uh, look at um, other tools that are free also, depending on what kind of um, device you have. For instance, my niece, Abby, who is 13, she, um, she's almost 14, she'll be 14 next week. She um, likes to make games, but she uses a different program, and it's only good at this point on PCs. So that's not ideal for everybody necessarily on this call. This was the most uh, adaptable one for today. But, you know, we could try it, and I think you'll see, you get the concept of how this works, and it's really interesting, and uh, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll enjoy it. And, again, potentially you could continue using this tool or a different tool, but at least for two weeks you'll have free access to be able to do all this game making. So... And what I want you to do now is if you've not signed up for an account, go ahead and sign up for an account. Make sure you have parent access, uh, parent uh, permission to do so. And then if you already have signed up for an account, you can log in. I'm going to go ahead and log into my account. And the first thing we're going to do is walk through a, um, a scenario of how, uh, basically a, um, uh, a tutorial of how this works. So I'm going to go ahead and hit log in here. And you'll see when this comes up, the dashboard of the Construct3 uh, website and allowing me to make, actually, I need to go to, where's my, my account? And I'm going to go to, uh, where is my dashboard? Try now. Should be able to go in there. Let's see. Launch now. There we go. So you can, if you are logged in, you can go to Editor. 
www.construct.net. I'll copy this URL and paste it for you as well. And you can just type that in and go straight to the um, editor part. And as I mentioned, we're going to go through the tutorial real quick, just so you can see all of the things that this tool will do for you. And one of the things that's really nice about it, again, you don't have to manually program a lot of things. It does it behind the scenes. It puts the code in for you in a lot of ways. And that makes it really super easy to use. Uh, and, but it, there's so many things you can do. It's pretty amazing uh, how many things you can do with this. Um, and just so you all know for when you, um, uh, you play around with this later, you can see there are game demos. You can use one of these demos to look at. You can look at templates to get started. Like for instance, if you need uh, a background that has car lanes, like you're gonna make a driving game or you want a Pac-Man type game, they have some um, templates that can help you get started. And here's one of my favorites, Flappy Bird. Uh, you can get a template to get started and then you can change out things like maybe you want the, the background to look different. Maybe you want Flappy Bird to be red instead of blue. There's all sorts of things. Or you could just change how he reacts. Like if he hits a pole, maybe he screams, ouch. You know, like any kinds of things you want to change, you can change in these templates later on and make your own uh, adaptation of a popular game you may have already used. Like this one here is Tetris, if you've ever played Tetris. And then there's also some beginner examples here. And we're going to go through this um, eight shooter or the ghost shooter tutorial um, example, this beginner's guide, because I want to show you just some basics of how this tool works. And so you know where everything is, and then you can use it and, and uh, toy around with it to make your own game. So we'll go through the beginner's guide. Click on that. Oh, not beginner's guide. Sorry. It's the, um, let me move this out of the way. Um, not the beginner's guide, the Ghost Shooter Tutorial. So we're going to open this project. And um, what this game allows us to do is actually create uh, different um, scenarios with these different characters. And you can see over here this project on the right-hand side. These are all of the things that are inside of our game. We have things like uh, explosions and bullets and we use the keyboard and the mouse and we have a player and so forth. All these things get listed here. And then the properties of the thing that we've selected, like if I select one of these items, you can see all the properties for that item over here. And so uh, that is really helpful for um, as you go through, it's again, very straightforward. Like I could change the color of the spot. I could just come down here and change it to a different color altogether. Like I could make it red. Let me get a better red than that. That's not very red. And if I do that, boom, see, it's all very straightforward to reprogram. So um, this play button up here allows us to play the game as it is built right now. So I can hit the play button and it's going to open up a third window or another window here. And I can actually play the game, which is really cool. And then when you're done with your game, you can actually publish your game and other people can play your game as well. And so, um, it's got a lot of great features, this tool does. It's taking a while to load, but it's coming in. It's getting there. My Wi-Fi must be slow. And as you can see, I can move around. I can, oh, here come some guys. I need to turn around. How do I turn around? I don't even know how, oh, I don't even know how to shoot them. Ah, I'm dead. I got I got killed by an alien. So um, I did not play that game very well. Um, so you can see there's lots of really cool things you can do in this tool. Um, let me go back to my dashboard. I'm going to go ahead and close this game out, this uh, tutorial out. Where's my um, thing? Oh, uh, I want to go to menu, project, and I'm going to go back to, I'm going to go close project. Okay. Don't, I'm not going to save my changes. I'm just going to. Oh, I don't want to do that. I want to go to my start page. By the way, there's two tabs up here. It wants you to always buy, but you don't have to. You just go to start page. And let me see. I've got the tutorials here. This is what I want to go to. I want to do the startup tutorial to walk us through here. Beginner's guide. This is what we're going to watch. And we'll watch it together. And 
you guys can um, certainly follow through if you follow it along if you'd like. So if you go to that dashboard, the start page, if you go to tutorials, that opens another uh, browser tab and you can start there. And um, this basically tells us it's going to help us create a project. So um, what we want to do is um, create a new project. So if we go over here to our tab and we say new project, we can give our project a name. So I'm going to call this Janet's example. And I can choose how big I want the background to be. You could just leave it at 16 by 16.9 uh, there. That would be fine. And you could say, is it going to be portrait? Like if you're on a phone, you may want it to be up and down or you may want landscape or both. So I'm going to keep my portrait. I'm, going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep my landscape. And I'm going to start my first page with something called the event sheet. And I will show you what that is in just a minute. And I'm going to say create. So I'm going to create a new project. And so in my project, this is my this dotted line here uh, gives you an example of where the screen ends. In design, we often call this thing an artboard. It's a place where you can put all of the different pieces and so forth. And so um, what we can do first is change the background. So you can change the background to anything you want. If you double click on the background, you can see there's lots of things we can choose to do here. And what we want to do is potentially choose a different background. And um, so we want to go to uh, tiled background. Um, and if we choose this, you can double click on it and choose that. We can then choose a background that we want to tile. And we can make any image we want. Like we could, let's say, upload an image from our computer. Or we could have, let's say I want to make a, uh, a color in here. Whatever I want to do, I can I can make this whatever color or what have you I want. So um, in this case, let's see what are my options here. I think where is this? Um, I think I want to go ahead and make it just like a green. I'm going to fill it with this like dark green for my background. But again, you can have a drawing that you upload and use as your your uh, your background. And when you tile something, it works just like in tiles in your bathroom or in your kitchen. It takes this square and just repeats it over and over and over again on your background. And so when I'm done, I'm going to go ahead and close it. And when I click on this, I, I, I'm sorry, when I click on the properties, I can say uh, I want to make this uh, tiled across my entire background, or I can even just change the color of the background here as well. Like I can also change it this way. So let me make, oh, no, that's the color of my item. Sorry. Um, and so I can, I should be able to tile it here. Let me see where my tiling is. Uh, properties. Not blend. Let's see, where was the tiling? I did this yesterday and then I forgot how to do it. Um, I guess we could also stretch it. Let's see here. And make it fill our background as well. But there's a way in here too. I just have forgotten how to do it. I thought it was this one, but it was not. To actually make it go... Um, let me see, maybe it's behaviors. No, nope, not behaviors. To make it actually uh, tile, like tiles would be in your bathroom, across the entire image. But I went ahead and just stretched it. Now I've got it there across the whole image. I can also, or across the whole background I have for my game. I can also double click, uh, not on, oh, the other thing you might want to do on this, they, they mentioned yesterday, is if you right click on it, you may want to lock something like your background. So there's this thing here, if you right click on your background, you can um, lock it in place so that you do not keep selecting it when you put other things onto the background. So that's a helpful tip that they shared yesterday when I um, went through their tutorial. Now you can double click on the background again after you've locked it, and you can add other sorts of things to your game. And if you want to add characters and so forth, those are called sprites. This little guy here under general, he looks like a little alien from asteroids or something like that. Um, and so I can add a sprite to my game board. 
and I can design him in here. I can create a new one. I can upload images and so forth and put them in there. And so I can create all sorts of different um, characters here and design them for my, my game. I can also uh, enter all sorts of other types of things that uh, already exist like in this game, like I've got, they've got things like I said, bullets or uh, other characters and so forth that you can use. Um, I'm gonna go back to our create, uh, let's see, to the um, menu here. And I'm gonna go ahead, you can save yours if you'd like, you can do project save. I'm going to go over to um, one of the existing templates and show you how we can make some changes to some existing things that are in the game. So I'm gonna go ahead and close mine out, my project, let's see. Project, close project. I don't want to save mine. And I'm going to go back to my start page tab. And I want to go to the templates because I think this is one that I think you all will relate to. Like, let's, let's pick one of the games that already exists. If we open this project, I was playing around with this yesterday. We can um, change things in this game. And you can see here again, there's lots of different events. There's lots of things going on. Here's the bird, right? Here's the bird in our game. He's this little guy here. I can change the properties of this guy. Uh, I, could, I could go ahead and say, let me um, edit what he looks like. I can edit his, um, I can make him red instead of blue. I can give him a different name. Each of the things you create, like let's say you have different characters in your game. You want to give each of these a different name so that you can tell them apart in this project. Um, you can also create events in the game. So you all are probably familiar with Flappy Bird. The way it works is you click, you, if you're doing it on a desktop computer or a laptop, you click with your mouse, or if you're on a phone, you press with your finger just one time to try and uh, move the bird up and then get him through a series of pipes. So we'll play it real quick, and you guys are probably familiar with this, and I'm, I'm really terrible at it. If you choose to play this game, by the way, uh, you have to use your mouse and click on the, on the um, laptop version. So it's gonna load. Okay, and I'm gonna say play. Oh, I, I see I'm already dead. That did not, <laughs> I'm already on the ground. See there, and I, you have to click, click. Oh, I hit the, the pipe. So you all are familiar with Flappy Bird. I probably don't have to show you this. I expect you probably have seen it before, but um, what I can do is actually, again, change some of the events and change how things work. So for instance, uh, like the tiled background that they have used here, um, you can see is this little orange and yellow um, grid. And then they've got other tiled backgrounds they're using too, like this one. You can see here, it's like grass. And then they've also got the pipes, right? Here's a, here's a bottom pipe. This is what the bottom pipes look like. They've designed those. And they've got top pipes that come down from the, the top, right? And depending on what device you're on, you can see you can do touch or you can do um, a click. And so if we look at this, uh, this type of object, where did it go? You can see our, um, our properties over here at the left, they use mouse input to be the touch for this particular game. But you could change that. You could take it, take it off and it would just be touch, right? But in this case, I can't touch my screen, so I need to use my mouse. Um, in the game, there are events. And if we look at the events, this is a list of things that have hap they happen in the um, start and then what happens when you move the bird around. So for instance, the, um, on any touch, you, anything you touch on the screen or you click starts the game anywhere on the screen. And it says, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna use, you're gonna make the bird jump this much every time someone clicks and you're going or touches the screen, either one. And this is what happens when some when a bird hits the the top pipe or the bottom pipe. It see how it says it goes back to start? That's the action that happens. I could change that and say, make the bird scream, ah, that hurts. You know, you could do any number of things you wanted to there. Um, and so, and then scoring, you know, you get one point for every time the bird passes through both pipes successfully, the top and bottom. And then in the background, you can see how they have set the background. Now in the real Flappy Bird, the backgrounds change a bit more often. So like for instance, I know in the real Flappy Bird game, 
I want to say if it's daytime, it looks like daytime outside. If it's nighttime, it looks like nighttime outside. Um, so you can change out how uh, the, the background looks, how fast it scrolls along in the background. Uh, that's what they're doing here. You see scroll speed. And um, finally, obstacles. You know, um, the, it's listing those pipes as obstacles and that those are things that, um, that the Flappy Bird can run into. And so you all can take a look at this and um, play around with it, or you can go back to one of these other uh, tools here. Um, if you go back, you can close the, the project by going to Project, Close Project. And if you didn't make any, I'm not going to save mine because I, I didn't really make any changes. You go back to the Start Page tab over here, you'll be able to see all these different options of templates you can use, or you can even just start with, um, again, uh, beginner examples as well, if you wanted to go in here and try some of these. But I would recommend going through some of these templates and, you know, like I said, a, a driving game or a car lane game, which is similar to a drive. This is more like Frogger, I think, this one. Um, or like Pac-Man. Uh, or you all have played, I'm sure, um, all these running games where you're running along. Like there was a minion one I used to love or they're running and they have to catch, catch all the bananas or grab the bananas along the way. Um, so there's lots of different versions here and it's 502. So what I want to do now is let you all play around with this for a little bit. Um, here's some that are like angry birds down at the bottom. Um, you go ahead and pick one and try it out and uh, see what you think. Like go ahead and play around with it. And, um, and you can try and, and, and change things out or, you know, create your own game out of it, have different outcomes. Um, if you have any questions while we're doing this, please feel free to unmute yourself or chat me in the chat box. I will, I will see it and I'll help you out if you have any challenges, but I want you all to be, have the opportunity to play around a bit to see how this works and how you can alter things, uh, throughout the game. And I think what you'll see is it's really complicated on the back end again. So you want to plan things out as best you can on the front end. That being said, we'll do this for like about 20 minutes. And then we have a guest speaker coming on who is here. He's actually a game designer and he worked on Minecraft and the most recent release of um, Crossing, uh, Animal Crossing, New Horizons. And so he's going to answer questions for you about what it's like to be a game designer. Maybe if you think this looks like a fun thing to do, what would you have to do to get to do this in college? Maybe, maybe there's certain classes you should take. Maybe there's certain jobs or internships you should try and get. Um, how would you get started? And I think he's, he's a great resource for us to talk to about his experiences. And, um, and really, if this is the kind of thing you like doing and you'd like to do it maybe for a career, it could be a really uh, fun thing. Uh, and you can ask him all sorts of questions when he comes on. So um, I'm going to give you guys, like I said, about 20 minutes now. It's about 5.05 p.m. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. But I'm going to let you all go through and play with this Construct 3 and um, try out your own game.
girls also um <clears throat> if you want to do another tutorial with a guided tour this is a really helpful tour i did yesterday and um as you started your um, new account you may have been prompted to do this um, I would highly recommend going through this as well to learn more about the tool and you can do this over the next few minutes if you'd like as well to get to this particular um, tour you're going to go from your dashboard here which is the start page up to this menu button just like we used before and go to guided tours and choose beginners guide uh, I apologize I was having trouble finding it again after I took it the first time but this will walk you through how to create new projects in this tool and um, how to edit all the things like your your um, character and what the character does and so forth. So you can also walk through this guided tutorial and that's really, I think, a helpful way to look at it. There's also another page, which I'll share with you here in a second. I think it's on this page um, about game development courses. This is good for follow up if you want to um, use these tutorials as well. and um, this is under the learn area and I'll just um, copy this um, URL for you here and put it in the chat box. It's another place you can go to learn more about how to use this tool and maybe um, ways to be creative with your games and so forth. Like if you want to put words that come up in your game, if a character does something or you want to guide them in a certain way. So uh, those, those two tips are there. If you want to go through the tutorial, like I said, I think that's a helpful thing. And that was um, up in the menu button from your um, homepage of your um, dashboard. Um, and we'll have, uh, let's see, it's about 520 now. So we'll do about five more minutes in the game and playing around with the game. And then we'll come back together before our guest speaker joins us uh, a few minutes after that.
Okay, ladies, I'd like to wrap up this part of our meeting real quick to and just learn a little bit about what your thoughts were on the game and the tool. And did anybody create a game? Did anybody alter a game they want to share? Well, I think maybe our guest might be coming in right now. So um, we can get started with that in just a moment. Let me go ahead and, and change our screen back to this so I can see everybody's. I know y'all have your cameras on, so I can't see your faces. But um, I yes, it looks like Christopher Smith, who is our guest speaker, is coming in right now. So Christopher, when you can hear me, uh, go ahead and let me know you're here and you can hear. Okay. Hello, Janet. Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Oh, I have my volume turned down. Sorry about that. Please go ahead. What were you saying? Hi, Janet. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thank so, you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So, ladies, I wanted to introduce you to Christopher Smith. He he is a senior web designer. Uh, sorry, it's not web designer, game designer for um, Nintendo. And as I mentioned, he's worked on some games you're familiar with. And I want to just preface this talk today by letting you know that in business, sometimes we have these agreements. They're called NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. And um, he, as an employee, can only talk about certain things with certain games. So I just want to preface that. He, he will answer what he can, but please don't be offended if he's not able to answer all of your questions, especially maybe detailed ones you might have. Um, because he has some uh, some requirements with the business he works with that he has to do that. So um, I want to give Christopher lots of time for you all to talk to him today about how he got started with video game designing and what it takes to become a video game designer, maybe what attracted him to that, and allow you all to ask him questions about that. Because again, this may be a career path that you want to take one at some point. And Christopher, just a little bit of background on the ladies on the call. They are senior Girl Scouts, which means that they are they are rising 10th and 11th graders at this point They because they're finishing the school year. But right now they're 9th and 10th graders. And um, so they probably have done some programming along the way, but I'm not sure how much game programming they've done uh, in their experience in school. Okay, awesome. So do you want to start off, Christopher, and just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I've uh, been designing games for around 18 years now. I've been working in the game industry for about 20 years. Uh, I started game testing at Nintendo and worked my way up through the industry. I was an assistant producer on a title, and then I found an entry-level game designer position at a studio called Handheld Games and worked there for a good almost five years, um, designing lots of plug-and-play titles, children's titles, and um, and then from there, I started working at other studios doing similar work. And uh, the last major project I worked on was Minecraft. And then most recently, I went back to Nintendo and we released Animal Crossing New Horizon. Yeah, I think a lot of the young ladies on this call are very, very familiar with both of those titles. Um, so, you know, you brought up a good point. Like, we did not cover the producer role. And what's interesting about how games are done today, I was sharing with them earlier that I started out playing on an Atari because I grew up in the 80s. And like the games today that we have are very different than the games I was showing them back then. Like they were they were not very <laughs> high quality back then. But it, it was the, the, what we had at the time. But today, as you mentioned, there's a producer. Can you tell us a little bit more about what a video game producer does? A video game producer pretty much covers all the scheduling um, making sure that each team is communicating with each other because in game development, there's many different teams. There's programmers, there's designers, there's artists, and there's testers. So everybody needs to communicate. And so there's the producer who runs in between all the different teams and makes sure everybody's on schedule, makes sure projects are going to be released on time, 
um, because projects are also broken up into different small little groups. So um, each, they call them, you know, stints or, you know, a sprint where you have a couple weeks of working on a specific feature in a game. And so the producer is trying to make sure that everybody's getting that one specific feature done instead of working on other things. Yeah. You know, it reminds me a lot of like the movie making process these days where you're trying to get scenes done or whatever. The the video game process and development process has mirrored that in a lot of ways, even using some of the same terminology like producer, that um, this level of entertainment uh, requires some really very specific uh, things get done or else you cannot actually produce the end product. And it's really fascinating. Uh -huh. Yeah. Ladies, yeah. do you all have any questions for Christopher um, that you ha you want to know about? Feel free to unmute yourself and just ask. It's okay. Hey, um, Janet. Yes. Abby would like to know how long it took to program Animal Crossing's New Horizon. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, unfortunately, I can't answer that because um, I'm not a programmer, so um, <laughs> the game has been worked on for quite some time. I'm sure they've probably been working on it over a year, and when I came in, I came in halfway through the project, so um, it was being programmed all the way up until release, you know, fixing bugs, and so um, that was kind of my focus on the project was finding issues with the game and giving feedback from a design standpoint. And then the programmers would go and make adjustments and fixes. So um, I don't know exactly when they started the project. Um, some projects like this could be up to a couple years, three years, four years, um, who knows. Um, but when I came in, um, you know, I came in near the end of the project, about six months into the end of the project. And um, it was programming all the way up until release. And even on because they're coming out with, you know, updates and um, patches and whatnot. So they're still even programming it to this day. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, I imagine like so everybody on the call uh, for the girls, like we were talking about, there's a release date. Just like you have a movie that comes out in the movie theater and it has a release date. You know, it's going to come out at a certain time. I imagine you all c could be like working insanely hard at the end to make sure you meet that release date. Christopher, is that, is that the case? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yes, definitely. Um, there's a, a common term in game development industry called crunch time. Yeah. And so when you have a deadline coming up, then everybody's in crunch mode. It's crunch time. And people are working 12, 14, 16 hour days. Sometimes people are sleeping under their desks, you know, just so they can get up and keep, get back to work and make sure that we can reach that deadline. Wow. That is, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. It can, it, but you know, um, we're all very passionate about it, so it doesn't bother us one bit. Yeah. Now what do you, were you just passionate about games as, as a kid? Did you, what, what drew you to being in video games? Oh yes, definitely. I remember the first video game I ever played was called asteroids and I was in kindergarten and, and I just fell in love with video games. And, um, you know, back then when they had arcades, uh, I was always in the arcade. And um, I was, uh, you know, I had my Nintendo and I always played that and, and then the Sega and all those other systems. And I just grew up through the years playing games and I always wanted to be in that industry. So I tried my hardest, did my research and figured out how to get my foot in the door. And, and so did you have to take any special classes in college to kind of get your way, to kind of get into the door? Like, was there any special training you needed? What kinds of things did you do to prepare yourself to to get a job as a video game designer? Well, um, I didn't really take anything specifically because back then there really wasn't any really many uh, game development uh, colleges. Um, yeah. There there was one um, that was by Nintendo, but it was really expensive and it was kind of new and I couldn't afford it. So um, I did the research and figured out how to get my foot in the door by starting as a game tester. And some studios will bring on people with really no experience at all. Just they look for that passion and excitement to work on games. And if you play games, then you're a perfect fit for <laughs> testing and finding issues with the game. So that's where I got my foot in the door. And I ended up working as a game tester for a few years before moving on to something better. And so do game testers help find problems and bugs in the, in the game so they can make it better? Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, everybody's found a bug at some point when you're playing a game and something mm -hmm. weird happens, or sometimes the game will freeze up and you don't know what to do and you have to restart it. Those are called hard locks. And so those are the biggest issues that we try to find the most because that's when, you know, it impedes on the player's experience the worst where you have to restart the game. So, um, yeah, definitely uh, finding issues. If the character acts all weird, falls through the floor or walks through the wall, or if you hear a weird sound issue or, you know, characters are saying things that don't make sense. Those are all bugs. Those are all issues that need to be reported and fixed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I was telling the, the girls earlier, we were talking about sort of storyboarding out the entire game and figuring out like what you want the characters to do and so forth. And I used the E.T. example, the E.T. game example, because I was just saying how terrible it was. And uh, and the whole user experience was so poor. Uh, and I'm sure you knew about the uh, all the cartridges they found buried in Arizona like 600,000 cartridges of ET uh, because it was just so horrible and, um, and frustrating from a user experience. And I imagine users help define some of how to change that user experience. Definitely. And also that ET story is a great example of why game designers are important because that game was developed by a programmer. And yes, back then you didn't really have game designers. So the programmer kind of pretty much called the shots and ran it. But he's programmers are so focused on coding and writing code and using their brain so much for logic and understanding of how the intricacies of the game works that it's nice to have a game designer who steps away from the code, who can actually focus on player experience, focus on what's fun, play the game while the programmer is programming and give the programmer the info he needs to code it right so it's fun. That's awesome. So Abby has a question. She wants to know if cheat codes are bugs or are they planned? <laughs> um, it's sometimes it's both, um, depending on the code. Like if it's an actual specific code that you got to type in, then those are planned. Hmm. Um, that's what the development team wanted. And they made sure those codes are in there so that the player can input them to have whatever the effect happens. But if it's an effect, it could, it could be where that issue was a bug at first, but it was kind of fun, and they didn't know if they wanted to fix it or not. And so they're like, well, let's keep it in, but in order to have it activate, let's put a code in there. So that way players have to put a code in to have that bug activated. But um, a lot of times, you know, it could be considered a feature, even though it was found as a bug. <laughs> it's funny how things are found that way in life. Like they originally start off as mistakes, but then we end up accepting them. And you can do that with like medicine too. Like sometimes you think medicine, they, they research it for one thing and it ends up solving another problem. And you know, it's not a bug. Right, exactly. Actually, yeah, that's pretty cool. So girls, <laughs> uh, ladies, any other questions you'd like to ask Christopher? I don't want to hog the time here. So he can talk to time. you. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else want to unmute and ask a question? Or if you're too shy, it's okay if you're shy. You can um, also type it into the chat, and I'll be I'll ask him for you if you want. You know, there's one thing I wanted to point out about getting into the game industry, and when you asked me about uh, taking special classes. Yeah. Um, over the years, more uh, game development classes have been coming out in colleges. And um, if, if it would have been like this now, back when I first got in the industry, I definitely would have been jumping into classes and learning all I could because that to me sounds the best way to go. <coughs> I was just unfortunate that there really wasn't anything back then for me. So I had to find another way into the industry. But now there's so much out there that um, that's the best way to go. And uh, you would have that one up when you actually interview for a job, an entry level job, and you may not have experience, but if you have a lot of that knowledge from classes, then that looks better than someone who doesn't have that knowledge at all. So I wanted to point that out. It's very important. Yeah, and it really has come a long way. Are there any colleges in particular that have like a lot of video game um, or game design type of classes that are known as sort of the better schools for that kind of thing? Um, well, I'm actually noticing that most big colleges, like here I'm in Seattle, Washington, and there's University of Washington, and they have game development classes there now. Back when I got in the industry, there wasn't any. Um, the biggest, the only one then was called DigiPen, and that's by Nintendo, and that's still around, still doing great, and so that would be the first way to get in, but back then it was expensive. I don't know how much it costs now. You might be able to figure something out, but uh, just do your research, and most big colleges will have game development classes now. 
Excellent. So Ariana has a, um, a question. She said, did you study about computer mechanism to be a game tester? Ariana, do you mean like how computers work or programming? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Christopher, what did you study to become a, a game tester? It sounds like maybe you didn't have to study too much. You could just go in entry level and they like to take people who are excited about gaming. Yes, um, but they do have a test. So they do oh. test you before the position. Um, and they're simple, you know, they'll show a video and they'll say, you know, list off the issues that you see in this video of gameplay. And, um, and you know, that's just one example. And, uh, and for me, though, I was a computer. I was big into computers. Um, I used to do tech support for Windows before I got into game testing. Um, and so, of course, I listed that on my resume. Any kind of computer knowledge is very def definitely helpful um, because, you know, you're using the computer pretty much the whole time working in game development. So computer knowledge is good to have. Um, but uh, I, I don't know if you necessarily need it for um, whatever the uh, game testing position that you're applying for. But uh, it always helps to know computers. And nowadays, computers and smartphones are all a commonplace. So it's the knowledge that just most people would have would probably be good enough for an entry level game testing position. That's very cool. It's interesting you have to take a test to become a tester. That's pretty funny, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. Ladies, what other questions do you have? And you can ask some specific questions. Like if you're familiar with some of the, the games, like I said, he may or may not be able to answer them, um, but certainly you are welcome to ask them. And if you want to um, put the game, the question in the chat, or you can unmute yourself and ask the question too. either way, whatever you're comfortable with. Since I'm, since I'm not at Microsoft anymore working on Minecraft, I'm more than happy to answer a lot of questions for that. It's just Animal Crossing, um, not really that much uh, because of what you explained. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm open to Minecraft questions. I'm curious if uh, the girls have played Inspiration Island. Um, that was a big one for me. And uh, or the Aquatic Quest mashup pack or the Halo mashup pack, um, any of those kinds of works. If you if you've played them, I'd be more than happy to answer questions for that. Okay. So, have you have any has anyone here played those games from Microsoft? Uh, yeah, they're called mashup packs. They're add-ons to Minecraft. Oh, so cool. The, the most recent one I did was Inspiration Island. Has anyone? And that played? was the tutorial yeah. one in Creative Mode. Very cool. Has anybody played with that one in Minecraft? they're shy a little bit uh ariana also asked how do you publish games so that they become popular that's an interesting question how do you make sure Ooh, a game becomes popular? Um, uh, one of the biggest things um that everybody's trying to shoot for in this industry is thinking outside of the box and coming up something coming up with something that's very unique um, so many different games have been done and you see so many of the same kinds of games that if you can find something unique and everybody on the team is on board and everybody's excited about it. And you do usability testing where you bring in people, um, just normal people who don't work in the industry and you watch them play and you ask them questions about the game. And if everything's going great, you know, you got something golden. And once it's released, you, there's a really good chance that it's going to do really good. But the other half of it is marketing. And there's another team in the game development studio. That's the marketing team. And they focus solely on getting it out there, getting, the knowledge out there so people know about the game and 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 the word of mouth spreads and so people actually play it abby wants to know what is the game that did really well that was unexpected that they didn't think was going to necessarily do well when they first released it but then was oh. just huge <laughs> minecraft <laughs> you know speaking of it yeah because that game first started by I think it was just like one guy and um, knock I believe his name and and uh, he he coded it himself and um, he, he only had a few creatures in there and he didn't know what to do with it. it was kind of a we call it a sandbox game where it's like you're playing in a sandbox and you're free to do whatever you want and be creative mm -hmm. and that's kind of the initial idea when he created the game and it started taking off and people absolutely loved playing in that universe and in that's that sandbox field, being able to dig and do and build whatever you want. And it just kept growing and growing and the team kept growing and growing. And now it's the second most popular game in the world. It's crazy. I, as a parent, I remember when it first was becoming popular 
And as we were talking about, like I grew up on Ataris and very pixelated graphics. So I was, I actually used to be a graphic designer myself. And so I was really oh, surprised cool. given the level of sophistication and, uh, and detail with graphics today in games that kids were so drawn to this very pixelated type of version of a game because I thought most kids would say, wow, that's really ugly. You know, like it doesn't, it doesn't look as pretty. It doesn't do, and, and shockingly, it is something that just kids of all ages really love. And to your point, can just make their own journey. They can do whatever they want with it. And it's pretty fascinating how flexible that game is and the things they can really do with it. It's a, it's an amazing tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting phenomenon that I've noticed, even with movies, where, you know, when uh, computer generated graphics started coming out in the movie, CG rendered scenes, um, it was cool at first, but now every movie does it and it's just over the top sometimes and too much. And now movies are starting to appreciate going back to old school days where they weren't using computer graphics and they were using makeup and special effects and all that classic stuff. And, and Star Wars is a great example of that. The new Star Wars, they a lot of the creatures were not CG generated. They were actually puppets and um, people are appreciating that more. So I think that's the same kind of phenomenon with Minecraft is that, uh, you know, games over the years, oh, the graphics got to be better and cooler yeah. and everything. And, and it's like, no, we're actually going back. We're going retro and and it's more classic feel and it feels more comfortable and it's kind of neat and appreciative. So. Well, I think it just, phenomenon. it just underscores, too, just how important the premise and the scenario of the game is. Like, if it's a fun game, it seems like people don't really care as much necessarily mm -hmm. that they're, like, high-level graphics. It doesn't necessarily have to be that. And that's what's so great. We were talking about the storyline and the scenarios you create and how important that is to develop before you even begin gaming, creating the game, be, uh, and actually programming it, because programming takes a long time. It's not easy to do, and uh, you want to think through as much as you can to make it as correct as possible and as finished as possible, but you're never going to catch, like you said, there's bugs. There's going to be things that come up that you got to fix, but you really want to think through that, and having a good storyline has got to be a really important part of the game. Oh, yes, definitely. Yes. Um, so Eric, that's one thing that we've struggled with at Minecraft was there wasn't really a storyline yeah. that much. So that was a, that was a challenge trying to find some way. And the only storyline you really got was in the end credits when you finally complete the end dragon, ender dragon, and you see credits and there's some interesting story there, but it's hard to tell and what. And so, yeah, that's a challenge. So Ariana mentioned that her, her uncle is a pretty big gamer. So she's heard of the games that you mentioned, but she's not really into gaming. And Ariana, I'll tell you what's real interesting. I, I have a young lady that works with me. Her brother is a professional gamer. This is kind of a very interesting thing. Ooh. Certain types of games uh, like Call of Duty is one. It's, it's a pretty um, aggressive game. It's a very violent game. So it's not one I, I wanted to share with you all today, but it's um, her brother, as an example, would be on these circuits and just like in NASCAR where they have sponsors and all, he had sponsors. He would go to these tournaments and play and he made lots of money doing it. And it's kind of interesting to see that that can even gaming can even be a profession for some people, depending on, you know, what, what you're following. And it's pretty amazing. So, uh, uh, but then there's people who just do it for fun and that's all good too. And it's, it's really interesting to see how it's evolved over time. Right. Oh, and Amberly just mentioned that Louisa High School. We we live we live in Virginia. Uh, most of us on this call live in Virginia, and um, in Louisa County, which is near Richmond, Virginia, um, they have an e games team. She just said, which is really cool. I didn't know high schools did that. That's cool. really neat. Um, another question: Do you have an all time personal favorite game? What's your favorite game to play? Oh, gosh, that's a really good question. Um, being a game designer, I try not to focus on one specific game because I'm always trying to keep my thumb on the industry, you know, yeah. trying to keep updated as much as possible. And so I have so many games, hundreds of games in my collection um, that I play them for a little bit and then I move on to another one and then I'll come back if it's really good. I guess one of the biggest ones that I really liked most recently probably have to be Sea of Thieves on the Xbox. Um, and uh, PC, and that was a Microsoft title. And the reason why I really, really enjoyed that was the feeling of adventure. 
not many games do that. They usually hold your hand through it, a single player experience, and they guide you through. And um, a lot of the levels are very linear where they, it's one way, you can't really go many different ways. And with Sea of Thieves, you were on um, a boat and you were casting sails and, and following the wind and finding islands. And, and you didn't know what was over yonder. And then you'd run into other players on ships and you didn't know if they were hostile or not, or if they were friendly. And just that feeling of the unknown off into the distance and just exploring that. I really love that. That's really fun. Uh, another question Caitlin has is, is there a game maybe you really wish you could have worked on that you really liked and, and wish you'd had an opportunity to work on that, that you didn't get to work on? Oh yes, definitely Halo. Um, oh yeah. Halo. I, I you know, um, working at Microsoft, the the studio who makes Halo is 343 Studios, and they share the same building as the Minecraft team. And so, you know, uh, when I, when the first Halo came out, I wasn't even working in games yet, and I was so fascinated by that game. Um, and I always that's part of the reason why I wanted to get in the industry is working on a game like that. And um, never got a chance to. And it was really cool, though, to be able to go and have lunch with the teams. And, I, you know, I'd walk by a lot of the developers and, and whatnot, but I never got a chance to really got to work on it myself. The closest I got was um, the Halo Mashup Pack 2.0 for Minecraft. Um, before they, the Halo team, 343 Studios, created a mashup pack for Minecraft where they created a world that uh, featured a lot of the levels in some of the classic Halo games but there was no gameplay. It was just, you could just run around in creative mode and just explore and see things. And so um, they tasked me with adding a lot of gameplay to it. So I used um, a lot of the internal programming and scripting um, tech that they have for Minecraft, like Redstone and um, Command Blocks. And I um, added a lot of characters that will spawn in and you can play against, fight against, or, or items that you can collect. And, and I guided the player through a more linear single player experience. So it's a lot more fun now. And what was great and I'm very proud of is after releasing the update to that and adding all that gameplay, I believe it's now like second most downloaded for mashup packs. So before it was like one of the least. So I was really proud about that when that happened. That is excellent. Ariana asked, um, there are some game like series where you get to choose what's going to happen next or what the avatar is going to do next is, are those games a popular? We were talking a little bit about like journey type games where you start, you have a character and you know, you go and you're on this journey, similar to what you're talking about with maybe the, the, um, the C game you were just talking about. Um, are, do you find that those are very popular? Those type of games where, uh, folks are getting to choose what happens with that avatar next, like what happens to that character next, and making those choices. Are those more popular or less popular than other types of games that might exist? Oh, those are very popular. I believe those are probably one in the top most popular, and they're growing. A lot of um, design jobs out there listed now, they're looking for a designer who specializes specifically in that type of game because there's so much involved. Um, about player progression, um, story arc, character arc, um, you know, uh, economy, because, you know, you're, you, it's a player progression and you're in a world where the world and the NPCs, like you mentioned about, you can choose what to say to them and how they react. You have to consider all that and that all falls into <laughs> the economy of the game. So that's, it's such a growing, um, it's such a big hit nowadays that it's becoming a large requirement for a lot of game design positions that is really interesting yeah i i can imagine because there's so many things to think about too along a, a path that if you have experience in a certain type of game you have a lot more of that experience and knowledge to bring to the team so they can avoid a lot of mistakes from the beginning that they might encounter yeah. if they don't have that experience that's that's really interesting yeah my brother likes yeah. the game i can't remember the name of it he's into gaming and there's one that I thought was really interesting. It's like about, it's an island game. You build an island. It's kind of like, almost like the Sims in a way that you build up your community. But then um, it's interesting because like you have to think about population planning and the economy of your island. And I mean, just really, it's very complex uh, issues. I was uh, saying to my brother that, my daughter, Emma, who's on this call, she's 14. She's in a class called Human Geography. And they have to learn about things like um, uh, um, the uh, income 
and the um, gross productivity of countries and so forth. And when they think about that, like what all are the things that go into it? And this game is a good example of how there's, it's so complex and all the things work together. And so um, it's very fascinating, the types of games that are out there and, and in some ways how complex they can truly get. Um, and, and this choices that you have, it's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for you, for certain decisions, you have to have predetermined uh, scenarios and you got to have multiple different scenarios for multiple different decisions. Yeah. Um, yeah, very complex. So how big is the is the team like on, on a game like you mentioned, like there's a, a group that develops the game. You were mentioning on Halo as an example that there was a game development mm -hmm. team there. So that is not part. Of, they're not really Microsoft employees, correct? They're actually like a game development studio. Oh, they're owned by Microsoft, oh, definitely. Owned by yes, Microsoft. Um, yes, but there's it's about half and half of actual employees versus contractors okay. and vendors. Um, Microsoft and other big game development studios, uh, they like to bring on contractors for a certain amount, of, uh, have them specialize specifically on one specific thing about the game. Like a design, for example, a lot of the work I've done is contract work and I'll come in um, for 18 months and it's an 18 month long contract and I'll come in and help out with the design team, um, work with the lead design and, and whatnot and, and hash out the game and whatever it is that they need to get done. But then once the game's done, then they don't really need that extra help. So then the contract's up and then they're done. And so you move on to another contract or when they want to start making something else, they bring you back. Very interesting. Ladies, what other questions do you have? Again, feel free to put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and just ask Christopher directly if you'd like. So we're working on this badge, Christopher, while we're just waiting to see if anyone has questions. It is an actual um, game designer badge. Uh, the Girl Scouts have developed. Cool. I wish they had a few more resources available. Like I had to go out and get my own resources and so forth. But uh, it's a great way to introduce these young ladies to an opportunity, I think, that you know, hey, here's this cool thing you could be doing. Like I said, after graduation, maybe you decide this is the kind of job you want to have. Um, so I'm really glad that they're actually promoting this with with girls in high school. Yeah, but Amber Lee mentioned they also uh, um, have a programming badge in Boy Scouts. She's she has a uh, a Boy Scout who just graduated from high school with his Eagle Scout, um, and um, her daughter Abby wants to know. Were you ever a scout yourself, Christopher? Yes, I was. You were excellent. I was, and I was also, in, I was in Weeblos as well, yes. Oh, nice. Well, and one of the things these young ladies on this call um, are going to be working on, um, similar to the Eagle Scout, we have an award in, uh, in Girl Scouting called the Gold Award, which is the equivalent of the Eagle Scout in Girl Scouting. And um, they have their whole four years of high school to work on it. And we were just talking about earlier today that this, set of badges we're working on is called uh, coding for good. And we were talking about some scenarios where, you know, really there's, you can use games in a really positive way to teach people new habits. Uh, I forgot to mention to the girls too, like gamifying in general, like making anything more like a game um, tends to be very popular today to try and change people's behaviors. Um, have you ever, other than like maybe Minecraft, which has its own set, I think, of uh, educational applications, are there any other games you've worked on that had sort of an educational element or you felt like were for a purpose that sort of taught people things or, you know, anything like that that you can think of? Yes, definitely. Um, when I first started in my entry level game design role at the studio called Hand Handheld Games, they focused a lot on making plug and play titles. So I don't know, maybe some of your scouts might have played it back when they were younger, but uh, there was Dora the Explorer plug and play, um, Nicktoons uh, Summer Camp, you know, um, those type of uh, plug and play games. And a, a lot of my design was going from the perspective of, you know, young kids are playing this. So let's add some learning elements to it. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, definitely. Uh, it was mostly back early, uh, early stages of my career um, working on those children's plug and play titles. Well, we were saying, you know, like we could use this for our gold award, depending on what your topic is in the gold award, you could make a program your own game to educate people. So for instance, like if you were trying to educate people about 
um, recycling. You could make a recycling game that helped educate people about what they could recycle, what they can't, and maybe help them understand that there's much more that they can recycle possibly than they realized. So there's a lot of application with games, I think, that can can go beyond just even for kids. It can even go to adults and really take your message and get it out there. It's, it's fascinating. And, and it's open to so many people now. I mean, almost anybody can create a, an online game now. It's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a lot of tools out there that are very easy to start jumping in right now. Are there any tools you would recommend? Like we were using Construct 3 uh, because it was one that was easy to use ac across uh, uh, different platforms because not everyone has a PC. People may have Chromebooks. Are there um, any types of uh, programming or uh, like uh, game design pla uh, platforms that might exist today that you would recommend that are, are pretty good for an age group like this? Well, um, one that st stands out to my mind is Learn to Code in Minecraft. There's a separate other version of Minecraft that you can get um, if you go to the Minecraft website. I'm sure you can find links to it. Um, and there was a whole other team that I didn't work with that focused solely on this, and it was the educational version of Minecraft. And there was Learn to Code in there, if I believe that was what it was called. And it was basic coding, and you could and it would visually show you in Minecraft style. And so you could actually drag and drop lines of code and it would teach you how to line them up so that the syntax and the logic was correct. And then you'd hit play and you could see it happen in Minecraft. That's so very- So that cool. would be a good start. That's yeah. really and, cool. And it got awards too, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I know some of the girls on the call probably have used code.org before, which allows you to uh, drag you know. and drop blocks together. And if you've ever used that, you know. like for instance, one of the games that they had um, was Flappy Bird then, and showing you how Flappy Bird works based on these blocks of code. Um, and it's interesting. It, I think it's what you're saying is really true that like it's so rewarding to be able to see your code and then hit play and see the the effects of everything that you have altered in the code and see it actually live there, how it's going to work. Yeah. Yes. And uh, for game design, um, most game design roles are not very heavily focused with code. That's why we have programmers. But um, one of the trends that's been happening lately is a lot of positions, game design positions in the industry have been catered and changed to feature some kind of coding for the, the designer needs to understand. And they call it scripting. So there's C sharp scripting is a good example or Java scripting, which <coughs> Minecraft was originally created in Java. And so if you want to be a game designer, a good thing to start learning now um, is to start learning C sharp scripting because you may not be programming the entire game, but you're scripting elements. You're, you're working with little lines of code that will have like, say, I want the character to say this if this happens. You can help uh, alleviate a lot of the pressure on the programmers by helping out with some of the scripting. So there is a difference there. So it's good to look into scripting for game design because um, a lot of those tools, uh, which I mentioned, like the two biggest ones that are most used in the industry is Unity and Unreal Editor 4. And those have scripting languages in them, C Sharp mm -hmm. scripting. The one I like the best though is Unreal Editor 4 because it has visual scripting. And what that is, they call it blueprints. Um, and what that is, is it's kind of the same as what you're talking about in code.org or what I was talking about in you know, Learn to Code with Minecraft is you drag and drop lines of code and then you link them up kind of like a, like a bubble graph where you have you know bubble of information and you connect them. Instead of actually typing the text as for the code, you're actually, instead of typing it, you're dragging and dropping bubbles. And so me, I come from an art background and like I did uh, in high school, I created this, the cover letter and the cover of the senior high school yearbook and, um, and, and a lot of other type of art. And I thought I was gonna be an artist, but that's where I changed my passion to design. And from there, I started learning about this editor that started implementing visual scripting. So you can actually look at it visually from an artistic standpoint, as opposed to a technical programming standpoint. That's that makes wrong. any sense. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you brought up Unity too, because I was telling the girls earlier that my niece, who is 14, likes to program on uh, one of the platforms, but we didn't go with that one, and it was Unity. I couldn't remember the name of it. She likes it a lot, uh, but you have to have a PC, I believe, and download it. So that was yeah. that's why we didn't use it today. But that's I've heard really good things about that one too. So I'm glad you mentioned that. 
Ladies, um, we're about at time here. So does anyone have any other final questions for Christopher before we let him go today? I do have one question. Um, so I know that like uh, when when like games were first beginning or just like programming in general, a lot of uh, females weren't really seen in the business. Um, would you say that that has changed today or just like in like game designers in general? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, you know, back when I started, there was, you know, I didn't really consider it, tell you the truth. When I first started working in the game industry, I didn't really consider, oh, oh, there's more females or less females than males. I, I just didn't occur to me. But uh, now that times have changed and, you know, more empowerment for women, which is great, you know, um, I'm noticing it more. And uh, yes, a lot more senior roles, um, uh, especially at Microsoft, I noticed a lot more women were being hired into senior roles. Um, but uh, personally, you know, I've worked with female programmers. I've worked with male programmers. It, you know, it never really occurred to me. Um, but yes, that's I'm, I'm sure that's the case now, like now that that's a thing. And, and I actually am kind of noticing it now. So, yes, definitely. Any other questions for Christopher before we let him go today, ladies? Okay. Oh, I, you know, actually to answer more on that question, I, I'd just add a little bit more to that. Yeah. I noticed there's a lot more females artists in the art team. There's a lot more female artists. So um, that's, that, that stands out in my mind now that I'm thinking about it. That's awesome. Well, ladies, uh, let's thank Christopher for his time today. Christopher, this was really helpful and educational for all of us. Thank you so much for giving up some time on your Sunday afternoon to be with us today and tell us about what you do and what this profession is like, because I think it's so cool. And hopefully some of the girls here might be thinking about, you know, going to this line of work too. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. And thank you for having me. I appreciate you having me. I'm, it's an honor. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Absolutely. Always good to have another scout on the call too. Um, and so ladies, <laughs> I just want to tell you all too, that this does complete the badge, but the, um, the um, Construct 3 free trial goes for two weeks. You can use that. If you do have a PC, you can probably download Unity as well or some of the other uh, tools we talked about today. And um, I hope you will continue to check it out and try these things and play around with it and see what you think because I think it's super cool and there's cool things you might be able to apply to your gold award as well. So uh, good luck to all of you. Thank you so much for joining me today. And if you want to join me for app development, that's going to be in two weeks uh, from 4 to 6 p.m. So y'all have a great rest of your Sunday and a great week. And everybody stay safe and well. You too, Christopher. Stay safe and well, okay? Will do. You too. Thank you very much. Thanks, y'all. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.